Hello, everyone. Thank you so, so, so much for joining and welcome to the eighth installment of the Digital Campfire Download, the series where I talk to the creatives and the entrepreneurs who are building and stoking the world's most interesting digital campfires right now. I'm Sarah Wilson, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm a digital strategist based in LA. I created the term digital campfire to refer to a type of online destination that's more intimate, more private, and more interactive than public-facing social platforms. I launched this series to meet the creative and entrepreneurial real forces behind hyper-engaged digital campfires. And my goal is really just to get inside them, understand the strategies that make them tick and burn, and especially in a time when there's so much uncertainty. I couldn't be more thrilled to introduce my guests today. But first, just a quick bit of housekeeping. I have muted all of you, so if you can't talk, that's why. Obviously, my guests are the exception. The conversation is going to run about 35 to 40 minutes. You will have the chance to ask questions at the end. Feel free to ask questions throughout the interview via the chat feature in Zoom. I, um, when I open it up at the end, I can get to them, but also I can bring you into the chat if you want. You can just use the little raise hand feature to do that. Um, also note this is going to be recorded and shared out afterwards. I am doing this from home as you can see, so we may have internet issues. We never know about that. So if you get disconnected, it hasn't happened yet, but if it happens, just dial right back in. Um, I put two two pieces of information in the chat, which you'll see, I put it to everyone. I kicked off an initiative last month in which I'm going to put a different BIPOC run digital campfire in the spotlight every month and invite you to donate with the understanding that I will never ask you to donate if I've not already done so myself. Um, this month, the campfire I'm highlighting is Ethel's Club. Uh, as you may remember, the founder uh, was my guest several weeks back. I'm putting the link again in the chat so you can join me directly in supporting their incredible work should you wish to. Um, and also we have a giveaway, which the information I will talk about in a few, but the information for that is there as well. Now on to my two guests today. I first crossed paths with Bailey, Bailey Richardson, way, way back in 2013, right when I started working at Facebook. She was one of the first early employees at Instagram. Facebook had just acquired Instagram a year previous to that. She was responsible for building and cultivating the community on the platform, which at the time had about 100 million users. Just to put that in perspective, Instagram now has over 1 billion users. After Instagram, Bailey went on to co-found People & Company, the New York-based consultancy that aims to take the mystery out of community building. Uh, People & Company's thesis is kind of like the thesis of this show. Community building is an art, but it's also a science. There are specific actionable things you can do to really build and stoke the fires of community. And Bailey and her team have acted as kind of community trail guides for clients like Nike, Substack, the Surfrider Foundation, and many others, helping them to really understand how to build communities both online and off that not only bring people together in meaningful ways, but also feed larger business goals. Bailey also co-authored a book on the subject last year called Get Together, all about what makes communities thrive. I have it right here. It actually has been my Bible. I love it, oh, love it, love it. <laughs> and as mentioned, Stripe Press has offered to give away copies of that book to every single person here live. Details on how to get your copy are in the chat. Just email that email address by end of day tomorrow and you'll get your copy. Bottom line, Bailey has been thinking about the, online, about the online community space for quite a while. When I reached out to her to be on the show, I asked if there was anyone she might want to bring on with her as someone who embodies those community building principles she really preaches. And she immediately said, you must talk to Lola Amalola. So I am thrilled and I'm sort of shocked that Lola is joining us here today that she had the availability in her calendar. Just a bit on Lola. Lola is a former journalist originally from Nigeria who started a private Facebook group, Finn, in 2014 in the wake of Boko Haram's kidnapping of Nigerian schoolgirls. The group was created as a place where Nigerian women, women could share their untold stories regarding, regarding sexual abuses and other challenges they were facing. She invited friends who invited friends to invite more friends to join the group. 
women located mostly in Nigeria, but also throughout the world. Today, FIN, which now stands for Female In, to reflect a much broader group of women, has 1.7 million members and gets hundreds of post applications every day. It's a perfect example of a micro community campfire. Here today to talk about community building and specifically the role of leaders in stoking the fires of community are Bailey and Lola. Ah, thank you so much for joining me today and for that long preamble, but I wanted to make sure I really spelled out exactly who you are because it's super interesting for both of you. Thank you for being here. It's a great intro. I like it. Like, <laughs> I'm going to have to reuse it. that. You can use that. You can use that. <laughs> so, uh, Bailey, because you're sort of the overview community person, I really, really want to, I'll start with, with a little from you. You know, as someone who sees community as a fundamental ingredient of digital campfires, I'm, I'm so thrilled both of you are here. And Bailey, I want to really kick things off by asking you to talk a little bit about the word community because it's perhaps one of the most overused words right now. I'm hearing it tossed around quite a bit and I actually think that's leading to a lot of confusion. So can you help us talk about how, how you actually define community? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first off, I also just want to say similarly so excited to be here in conversation with Lola and my secret aspiration for all of you here is for me to speak actually as little as possible because Lola's personal experiences and her thoughtfulness on the topic are absolutely world class. So um, Lola, just excited to be here with you and want to want to second that. Um, but yeah, I think it is really important before we go into talking about any detail of tactics or um, sort of specifics or strategies or uh, approaches to community building to get on the same page about what that word means. And I think that's in part because of the internet. I think when people used to use community and when I talk to people who are over a certain age, for them, the immediate association is people near where I live um, or maybe my work. And we've gone through a 20 something, 30 something year period of changing the way we connect to each other. And I think the definition of community is a little bit detached right now because of that change. So there's a lot of different ways to define a community and I'll tell you what people and company uses for a definition. And I'm, I'm a little bit less uh, specific about the exact words we use and, and care a little bit more about the components of a real community. So our definition of a community is a group of people who keep coming together over something they care about. And I'll just, break it down a little bit. So again, it's not so much yeah. about the words, it's about the components. Uh, a group of people should be specific. Um, a lot of people have started to use that word as a euphemism for a general audience or a big user base. And it loses a lot of its power um, and meaning when that happens. So trying to get really specific about who that group is, is really important if you wanna be effective in your work. We're gonna talk with Lola a bit about her community, I'm sure. And it started out as Nigerian women. It has expanded since then, but that is a reasonably specific group. And I'm sure Lola could add even more color to that as people who are politically engaged or engaged about certain issues and looking to speak about them with others. But it's not a generic term, it's a specific term. Um, the final two pieces are it's people who keep coming together. If you have like a one-off event and then you never see each other again, in my definition, that is not a community. A community is the people who keep showing up for one another. In Lola's group, they're the people that are there day in and day out. Maybe BK who's with us today, who's shown up for Lola again, and this group perhaps. Um, but it is, it is something that you need to keep showing up to in order to build those meaningful relationships. And in a business term, that's retention. You keep coming back. Uh, the final piece is the magic piece. It's people coming over, coming, get, coming together over something that they care about. And that part is different for every single community. And that part often comes out of a very personal sense of mission and purpose that either original organizer like Lola or a small group of people have. They see something, they see an elephant in the room that's not being talked about or um, a, a service that people need that's not being offered. And that is the connective tissue that brings these groups of people together over and over again. So that's our definition of a community. And the final thing I'll say, and then I will stop rambling, is the way that we have seen the most thriving communities be built today is you build them with people, not for them. 
Lola, that shows up in your story in many different ways from the original content that you posted and shared being from voices of your community to the moderators and the way that you've approached that. Um, but it is not an action of dictation or control. It is a grassroots ground up collaborative effort and your job as an original leader is to create ways for other people to become leaders, to create opportunities for people to contribute and give. And that mode of thinking is very different from, especially in the business world, a traditional way of thinking about marketing and controlling the message and talking to the masses. You're building from the ground up person by person, passionate person by passionate person, instead of speaking to or at a bunch of people. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's the definition. And then the main thing I just try to impart to people is always think about building with instead of for. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, that framework is invaluable. Mm -hmm. I feel like I need to write it on a napkin and put it like on my wall. It's basically <laughs> what you talk about in the book. And so I will be doing that. So, okay. Given that Lola is, it has created this community that is truly a shining example of all of the different parts that you just sketched out. I'd love for you to tell a little bit about your story, sort of the impetus for starting Finn, because I think a lot of people know the story, but perhaps not all. Um, and it would be great to understand sort of what the driving principles are, and then we can go into kind of how you actually hit and checked a lot of the boxes that Bailey just described. Um, thanks so much for saying all that, Bailey, because it really hits at the core of what the community is. And not only theoretically, in practice as well. So I can relate to it absolutely everything you just said. Now, for me, creating our group on Facebook, uh, you know, it seems to most people looking from the outside in that is just, you know, all you have to do is hit create group and you're ready to go. You have a community. But I think that far from it, um, I think that, you know, actually building a community from the ground up is something that begins with your personal awareness. It, it begins with your own personal awakening. So I was only 11, year old, uh, 11 years old when um, something happened at my family house. I lived, I was raised in Lagos, Nigeria, and, uh, you know, I got into an interaction with one of my family members, an aunt, who told me to leave what I was doing to go wash plates. And essentially, you know, she, I, I communicated to her that I was busy and I was unable to do that because I'm, you know, studying for school. And my dad had asked me to stay in the room and just not leave and spend my time studying. And she would not even consider having my brother go wash the plates because, you know, don't you know you're a girl? This, literally, these six words she uttered completely changed the trajectory of my life and who I saw myself to be. And I was only 11 years old. So from that day, it, was, it seemed like the blinkers were <laughs> just wide open because suddenly I started to see that my experience as a girl was separate, very different from my brother's experience because it's not a girl, because it was a boy. And I started to see other women around me, started to understand their role, started to understand my role in connection with you know, the people around me. And it's quite unusual that when you're that young, at age 11, to be so aware of gender roles and understand in, you know, you, the expectations are placed upon you and feel the weight of those expectations. But that is where I found myself. So from a very, very young age, I knew, it just felt like I knew what I cared about and I understood what my purpose needed to be. I'd been looking for ways to, you know, assist with, you know, helping women understand that I see them, that I understand what the experiences were, that I see their pains, I see their struggles. But I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to, you know, how to reach out. And then, and I, but I, I, in several different ways, I worked as a journalist. I, you know, I did several different things in my life, mentoring people, mentoring women, spending a lot of time around women, just listening. And then in 2014, an extraordinarily tragic event happened. You may know about the Bring Back Our Girls campaign in Northern Nigeria, where armed men literally stormed the school and kidnapped close to 300 girls. I think that that day was the day clarity hit me. Mm -hmm. It became clear to me that, oh my God, I could not just be dropping into this anymore. I had to do something. I had to make a move. I, like I, you know, like I said earlier, I still wasn't quite sure what it was, but I just knew that I could no longer just stay on the sidelines. And I cared enough to do something, had to figure out what it was. Well, it ended up being me starting our Facebook group. Um, you see, whenever I turned on the media at that time and the conversations, you know, happened on that issue, it was always about terrorism. It was always about, you know, the, the reason why the, um, the terrorists took the girls and so on and so forth. That was 
That's what everyone wanted to talk about. So essentially, the girls had become a footnote in a larger story about terrorism. It was never about them. Nobody knew their names. I mean, I called up journalists and said, hey, what are the names? Of, can you just tell me five of the top of your head? And no one was able, none of my friends was able to, they had to check their notes to come back to me. This haunted me. Like mm -hmm. I struggled with eating, I struggled with sleeping. And that was the reason why I created our group was that I saw that other people wanted to have conversations about everything, but what really led us here, which is what I believe to be a society where we were raised, we were very deeply conditioned to shut up and bear abuse. And our men were being deeply conditioned to torture us. <laughs> essentially. Right. And so the deep culture of systemic abuse, I felt, was rooted in our culture of silence. The fact that women were not speaking up, weren't sharing our experiences. In fact, you got punished for expressing yourself as long as mm -hmm. someone felt you were speaking out of turn. And that was what directly led to me creating our group. I wanted to find women like me, people who also were struggling with going to sleep and were struggling with, with eating. I mean, I'm a mom. I have two little girls. And those girls could have been them. He could heck, it could have been me. And that was the reason why I, you know, that was the reason why I started our Facebook group. So we could meet and have a conversation about it. It was it's a secret group. It was a secret, it was a secret group on Facebook. So you have to be a member in order to join the group. And right. so you can imagine, you know, I, I thought it was only going to probably find a few women, maybe, you know, maybe five women, maybe 10 women who could just kind of huddle together and try to figure out the best way to shine the attention, to shine the light on what we felt really mattered. But boy, oh boy, we are at four, four years old and close to 2 million women. And yeah. small so, nation. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You don't plan that. Right. You don't plan that. So right. that is the genesis of, you know, why I, I'm doing this completely crazy thing and <laughs> why I feel like it's what I need to do until I die. I mean, that's the most inspirational story I've heard in a very long time. And it's also such a testament to what getting angry and getting motivated can do to actually build a community. So you're creating this forum for women to talk to each other, literally talk, which is something that has not really been able to happen in that community, really, in that larger community. So how did you actually get the first conversations going? Because you had a really interesting technique that I'd love for you to talk about. And I feel like it's informed by your work as a journalist, because I don't know if you would have come at it quite this way. And it's super agree. interesting. Yeah. I completely agree. I think that my background as a journalist definitely plays a part because you and I both know, uh, Sarah, that, you know, beyond the will to win, you need the skill to win. Yeah. And therefore, the fact that I understood and I knew in real terms how to get people to pay attention to something, you know, was certainly very useful in those early days. So what did I do specifically? I literally, you know, this is, I came to a realization that I needed to help people understand what worried me. And I also knew that I was not, you know, the best, necessarily the best person to do that myself. Because for number one, I wasn't exactly an abused woman who was struggling under the weight of the system. Because the truth of the matter is, I was raised by largely liberal parents who were super kind, who loved the crap out of us. And I got pretty good education. I was allowed to say whatever popped into my head and knew that I would have adults who would sit with me and take the time to answer every single one of my questions. So this was my experience. So I was not prob probably the best person to communicate, you know, what I felt needed, the conversation needed to be and what people needed to pay attention to. So what did I do? I went all over the internet to go look for those people who were able to be what I could not be in that moment. And I would, you know, so for instance, I would go on, you know, Twitter and I would go on blogs to go see if anyone actually says anything that captured the a specific story that I felt mm -hmm. needed to be told. And I would find excerpts. I mean, they were simple excerpts, no, no, you know, no big copious notes, just really short excerpts of, um, you know, uh, an expression of something that happened, of an occasion that had happened. So for instance, I remember some that I remember from the past, I actually told Billy about this, was one I remember where a woman said, um, my parents 
are not allowing, they don't allow you to date. You don't get to date when you're, you know, until you're about 25 years old. And you have to show up with a husband within six months after you are allowed to date. Like that is crazy. Right. The fact that we, we, we are being told at one point when we become adults that we can be free now, you can be free now, but you are just breaking out of the chains of if you even breathe on your own, we will get you. So it is just this constant barrage of control from everywhere in a society that systemically believes that they need to choose for you, not just what you do, but also what you say, who you are, how you breathe, how you move. From as early as age three, whenever a girl shows any sign of self-awareness, there's always someone next to us who will literally pinch us, like an actual pinch, like she would put her hands together and twist, put it on your side and twist. Like we were raised with pain to shut up. Right. There was Either an active because, silencing. And so literally, fact, this group is like literally a re like a, a rebellion against that. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Our yeah. community, the very existence of our community is yeah. in defiance to the culture that we were raised in. Yeah. And that would have been deep and stolen all our lives. Exactly. Talk about having a purpose. I mean, talk about having a, a clear and present purpose. Uh, what I think is so key, and I just want to emphasize from what you did, is you, you sort of curated the internet. You went around and found yeah. pieces that you knew would speak to this specific group's wants and needs. And I think curation is something we've talked about before on the show. It's, it's so, so important to helping people understand what you're about, communicating your values. What, what matters in this group. So I want to understand, you know, that the group got really personal, really vulnerable, really quickly. Uh, really, I'd love really you to talk, talk a little bit about that, but then also it goes from zero members to almost 2 million members. How the heck do you retain that spirit of vulnerability and sharing? Do you mind if uh, I add pretty just pretty one cool. other yes. little add. thing? And Belly, please jump in. Yes. Sorry, I just, one thing that Lola did, and Lola, we tell people this in trainings all the time. Uh, Lola is the example. Some of it is, Lola, you had the instinct because you're a journalist and because you know the subject matter, what anecdotes were remarkable to pull out and to elevate. So you understood the ecosystem and you could say, that is worth highlighting for my community because of your skill. The other thing that you did that a lot of people don't think to do is you elevated other voices. You, you role modeled how a regular person could participate by putting rate other people's voices up as posts and got people to share their own stories in the comments and then would take those comments and put them as new posts. And that is a tiny difference, but people all the time try to start a Facebook group or start a group and they talk at people. They post their own perspective and people come into the room, come into the party and they think it's a lecture. They don't think that mm -hmm. there's space for them to participate and speak. And Lola and, and a couple other Facebook groups that we have studied that have been really successful have made it very clear and very immediate that this is a place for you to speak and for you to share your stories. And that difference is really important because really? One, one end game is a brand or a leader just keeps speaking at people and they wear themselves out when they have nothing left to say and it's all on them. But what Lola has done is created a true forum by role modeling, this is what happens in this space. And so I just want to point that out because that decision made so much of a difference, I think also in the likelihood of the growth, the group growing and reaching more people and more and more stories being told. If I may jump in here, uh, Billy, just as you said, I actually like to liken it to a real estate um, open house. So mm -hmm. essentially that is what I think majority of people do when they start a community. Um, they would feel you know, that they have a responsibility to show people what to do when they're in the community. I mean, I understand that you need to kind of show people how to behave within the community. But unfortunately, there is, you know, that what usually happens is, you know, when the real estate agent is in, brings it to the house, she's showing you the living room, she's showing you the master's bedroom and showing you the French doors. She just automatically starts to do that. And then for the people who she's, the clients are just watching and responding and reacting to the actions and to what she's showing. That's what usually happens. That's 
the relationship that is formed. And unfortunately, when you start, the way you start is usually the way people continue to behave. So they're looking to you. So what I wanted to do, what mattered to me at the time was to communicate. And it wasn't planned. It wasn't like it was a big strategy. That would be a complete lie. It was just me doing what was instinct. You know, just, it was my instinct was to help people understand what mattered to me without me being the one to say it. So I brought, because like I said, I didn't wholly embody some of those experiences. So I wanted to bring other people's voices into it. So when I got those snippets of information, like the other woman who said she went to the, to get her hair cut and the guy at the barbershop would not give her a cut before getting a note from her husband saying it was okay to cut her hair. This does not seem like, may not seem like much to most people, or it may just blow your socks off. But, and that was exactly what the impact was on our community. I just brought that snippet. It was just a two-liner. Made it into a post and it removed myself from it as much as I could by essentially no, I didn't say anything. There was no uh, story before it. There was no, uh, you know, there was no preamble. There was no, I just basically put it in quotes and let people respond. And so my expectation, I have to tell you, and this relates to what you were asking before, uh, Sarah, is that my expectation was when women interacted with those, uh, those snippets, they would, you know, say, have a wide angle, like, you know, like punditry, just say, oh, this is a terrible thing. Why is this still happening in 2000 and, you know, in 16 or 2015? That was not what happened. Shocker. What happened was mm -hmm. comment after comment after comment. These women came to the post and said, oh, this happened to me last week. This happened right. to my sister. This is happening to me right now. I'm it here. got I'm super, it allowed them to be super so, personal. Yes. Like it, it gave it them permission. Yeah. Yes, it hit at the core of their personal experiences that were real for them in the immediate mm -hmm. time. And that mm -hmm. completely changed everything. It, it is a game changer. Thank you so much for calling that out, Bailey, because those are two really key ingredients for anybody listening that you really want to think about. How do you tease out that? It's like a create a feedback loop of conversation. What is going to drive that? We actually have a question from somebody, so I'm going to bring her into the conversation um, just, to, just to ask the question, and then we can continue. I just asked to unmute you. Okay, are you? Hi. Good afternoon. Hello, Lola. Hi, Sister Mika. How are you? Did it, I met you. I remember you. Did we not meet in New York? No, we met in London. In London, yes, at the Finn oh. event in London. I remember you. I remember you called me Mommy Gio. I remember? sure did. I sure did. I, I see you. I hear you, sis. Yeah, I, I, I loved the part where you talked about a woman getting permission from the husband before she could bab her hair, because that happened to me recently. I babbed my hair, and a lot of people were like, oh, what did he say? Why did you cut your hair? Did he give you the permission to do that? And I told them, look, I am married to my friend. He lets me do what I want. He lets me feel good. He just looked at it and said, oh, you look 10 years younger. <laughs> a lot of people thought, oh, why would you pop your hair? Because it's going to make you look like a widow. You know, that is a tra tradition on hair. When you pop your hair as a married woman, it's either you want to kill your husband or he yeah. is dead and you're mourning him. So we need to get out of all of this. And you see, Finn has taught me quite a lot of things. I keep telling people I am a pastor's wife, but one of the things that I have learned from fame is to tell my voice that the typical African woman wants to teach the African girl how to live in a husband's house. I want to teach my boys how to take care of somebody else's daughter when they get married to them. This is your, your group created. The, I mean, this is incredible. Like, did you, did you plan? I don't know if you planned this. You planted this. Again. Oh, I, I, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> it's just more like what a testament to this incredible group that, you know, your life has been influenced in. That's one, you're one person. Uh, and there's 1.7.8 million now. It's pretty incredible. Thank you. That is a I, I think I'll let Lola continue because of the yeah. time. I'm so happy. Thank to you for the audience you granted me. 
Thank, thank you, you for so joining. much for joining. Yeah. Thank you. So that, you know, I, you know, to answer, there was a question you had actually asked about how do you at that scale yeah. you know, maintain the vulnerability on the community? And that was actually a beautiful question that Bailey also asked me uh, during our first, uh, first podcast interview that we had uh, for Get Together for the book. The truth of the matter is, what, you know, it, it really comes down to, you know, trying to make sense of what vulnerability is. Mm -hmm. Vulnerability is, you know, us stepping out of our regular, what we feel is acceptable <laughs> to the larger audience and sharing a, a piece of ourselves that may, you know, without having any control of what feedback mm -hmm. we might get and just surrendering ourselves to, you know, to the storm <laughs> that might be coming for us. And it has, for in the community I grew up in, community uh, vulnerability has a huge price. You pay a huge price for vulnerability. And so, the more we grew, as our community continued to grow, we just kept, made it even more vulnerable. We tightened the rules of vulnerability. So the more vulnerable people were, the more cohesive and the better and the deeper connections we were forming. And so, for, for instance, in the beginning where we would, we, were, we would allow some random questions or, you know, to be posted on the group, like people just wanted to know something or, now, our number one post-approval rule is tell us something significant about you. Mm -hmm. So there's a very specific prompt, basically. It's, it's, so people yeah, know how to format and they know what they'll because, get. It's because generally we don't talk about ourselves. We were, like I said, we were raised with pain not to talk about ourselves. And mm -hmm. so we, it's a challenge. It's not even a prompt. It is a challenge. So your even ability to take space within that environment it, it, you know, it makes you, we're essentially challenging you to first step outside of your regular, to even be, you know, to even have your voice presented within the space. Like this is the responsibility that you have. Mm -hmm. Do you want to join our movement to force conversations that matter to women and to tell us something about you that you normally would never tell anyone? Mm -hmm. So that, it, it that does. is what I think has been one of the most uh, useful uh, things that we have done that has made a difference. It's just, we just made it more vulnerable. So the more yeah. vulnerable, the, the more connected people feel. It's so interesting because I don't often think of there being a tactical way to kind of tease out vulnerability. Billy, have you seen this in other groups that you've worked with? Sort of yeah, these I, types of tactics. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think, you know, honestly, Lola, has such clarity around so many things, which is why she's been so successful. And really, Lola, you said it very clear to me, I believe on our podcast interview, that most, most connection comes through vulnerability. Human connection doesn't come in easy moments. We feel bonded to each other through vulnerability. And I think you can see that big and small through all sorts of communities. So Another community that we had the chance to get to know um, was a community called The Dinner Party. Mm -hmm. And two girls started it who lost their parents very young through long sicknesses, uh, cancer. And they realized that a lot of grief care was not for people their age. It was for people who were older. And in fact, grief care was held in the hospital where for both of them, they had sat for months helping their parents through the last stages of their lives, which was the last place that they wanted to be. So they started a dinner party themselves uh, where they could talk openly about what it's like to live with grief, whether you're three years on, whether you're five years on, whether you're two weeks in. And there are now in some cities like New York City, more than 50 of these tables mm -hmm. that the organizers take applications from people and personally curate. And similar to, to you, Lola, they've said that they've kept the application really long with lots of questions because people actually enjoy writing about these things that no one ever asks them about. And to take it to like a much lighter version of this, I think in the very early days of Instagram, it was really about creativity and being seen and people who felt like maybe they were creative trying to take creative photos and getting feedback from clusters of people who might say, yeah, that's awesome, keep going, or even in fashion, things like that. So I think this sense really of, I feel like I need someone to see this about me, 
can I put this out there and someone else saying, I see you is what is at the center of these like non-geographical communities? It's something about you that your current cluster of people don't appreciate, don't understand, or you don't feel comfortable talking to them about and needing to reach beyond that to satisfy that, that gap. Um, and so I think that that shows up in all sorts of different ways for all thriving communities. And, and these girls who started the dinner party say, if you wanna start a community, if you sense that there's something missing, look, try to figure out what is the elephant in the room? What is the thing that no one's talking mm -hmm. about? What is the gap? What is the thing that people are, are wish they could have more conversations about and have an, a safe place for people to do that? And, and so mm -hmm. I think that sense of exactly what Lola's talking about is, is the root of a lot of human bonding. I think, think sometimes fun is also the root of a lot of human yeah. bonding. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's on the other side. But I think to me, the communities that are really making deep change, like I think we can see how many participants and attendees here are here for you, Lola, and are here from your community. And that's because you've changed our, you've changed our lives or you've really moved, healed a pain or released some kind of structure or st like something that was keeping them bonded in a way that made them um, happy. Mm -hmm. And that to me is the work that is most urgent. I still love to have fun, but there's, <laughs> there is like mm -hmm. a true value, a deep, a deep value, a life-saving value for some that I think Finn fulfills by creating space for honesty that wasn't there before. Um, to, yeah. add, to add to what uh, Billy was just saying, I, I do agree with everything, but I also would like to say that, you know, to reiterate what you actually said, it is, so the job of those of us who lead communities is to do, and this is what I see to be my job, the core of my responsibility, is to create the right atmosphere and the right conditions that make people feel comfortable uh, expressing themselves and makes people feel comfortable just being, just existing within the space that you've created. So, you know, this is what I think is our number one role uh, to create those conditions. It's, you've basically sketched out exactly how to do this for people who want to start. It sort of starts with finding this, this need. What is, the, what is the need that's going to speak to the core of something that's the not being seen? I love how, Bailey, how you identified that around sort of what's the, what's the space uh, that's, that's not being spoken to. Um, I want to understand because right now you said any non-geographical communities. And obviously right now geography is completely, they've been exploded as people are you know, decamping to different locations because of this pandemic and just not living amongst people in the same way. So do you see either Bailey or Lola, you know, this digital community becoming even more important in this moment we're in? Absolutely. Do you want to take that, Lola, or should I, <laughs> should I go for it? What do you prefer? I, you know, please go first. I'll, I'll speak right after. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that human, humans need all of it. I think like we are so social and it is our primary orientation. So I think there is, um, I think some of the digital things that are happening right now are filling the gaps that we have elsewhere. But I recently read a, a book um, called uh, The History of Collective Joy. And this woman studied the things that bring us joy and have brought every culture and every civilization joy for millennia or however long we've been human beings here. Someone with a history degree, check me. <laughs> and the three things were feasting, dancing, and um, costuming. And I was just thinking about how the internet doesn't do those things necessarily <laughs> super well. And the next big thing. <laughs> yes. And it doesn't mean that what the internet does isn't valuable. It just means that it doesn't do everything. And Lola, I think Finn is an interesting example of a community that um, connected people across the diaspora. And now you do meet people in person to just fill that other side whenever you can to make it real. And I think there are also communities that start in person and become chapters in other cities or spread out from that uh, like physical restraint to be online. And I, I think we're moving into a space in the world where outside of a pandemic, hopefully we will just have a balance of both of these 
things because they do, they're tools for different kinds of connection. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, communities online are going to get bigger and we're going to find new ways to make them even more valuable. Um, I don't think they're going anywhere. Um, the truth of the matter is this, the, the ability to scale these communities are unbelievable. Um, you know, everybody told me when we just got, you know, when we were starting our offline events that, you know, communities you form online just don't translate into, you know, into the real world. They just don't, they call, the, call it the real world, you know, offline. They don't really translate. People don't really sign up for the events and, you know, just show up uh, and, and, so, and so on and so forth. That was when this was just starting out. And they were wrong. They were mm -hmm. wrong. They were dead wrong because we have had events in more than 80 cities across four continents. And, you know, we've had events where 3,000 women have shown up. I mean, they are jamborees. They are festivals. Mm -hmm. um, we just had, we call them Think Connect. Our offline events, we call them Think Connect. Has had women, you know, come join me, you know, here in Chicago, out in New York, London, Lagos, you know, like around the world, South Africa, everywhere. So the truth of the matter is our community has not, I don't think our community online has arrived to where it can go. I don't see it going anywhere. And I still, I see it now becoming the primary way to connect people and then real life as the secondary way to connect people. So even when people meet offline, I see them going online to go understand the temperature of the people that they just met and letting mm -hmm. that define and decide whether they choose to continue to explore relationships with the people offline. That's yeah, such a good think, way of putting it, taking the temperature. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. I, I would only underscore that. Um, we, have, we have met a couple of groups also that are primarily online. A woman who started a, a chronic illness community that meets in person and also a choir in Toronto that's amazing. Choir, choir. Oh, yeah, choir, choir, choir. I actually went to one of their events. It's wow. amazing. It was and those incredible. Both, yeah. Those both started through actually prototyping online, kind of like yeah. putting a little like tester out there. Would anybody want to do this? and mm -hmm. trying with the group. And so in a weird way, you know, when we, when we interview community leaders or prospective community leaders, and we ask them, what, what are you most afraid of? People say the same thing, no one's gonna show up. And mm -hmm. it's really interesting to have digital tools to just see, test the water. Like, is anybody interested in this? Cause I really mm -hmm. care about this, which in maybe some ways Lola was a little bit of what you were doing. You're like, I need to talk about this. Like, mm -hmm. does anybody else need to talk about this? And, and the quickest, simplest, like least risky way versus showing up at a cafe and sitting there hoping someone comes is by, by testing it online and seeing if anybody else cares. So I think that testing the water, kind of prototyping the idea through some form of a digital tool, mm -hmm. I, I, I totally agree that it makes a lot of sense to do it that way at this yeah. point. And then we decided to push the envelope. We decided to see, like be our initial events were just essentially us meeting in person, you know, and kind of breaking the ice in person. And then we pushed the envelope and we did, decided to see if we can move the tone and the heart and the engagement of our community into the in-person events. And it got personal really quickly, offline mm -hmm. as well. While we were looking each other in the face and people mm -hmm. were crying and we were bawling our eyes out and we were laughing together and we were dancing and twirling each other. Like the truth of the matter is, as long as humans are connecting, I don't see a difference between right. the way we're connecting online and the way we're connecting offline. This is right. my experience. And at the scale that we have, and in a society, let, I mean, let's think about the culture. We have a culture where we were deeply like schooled to stay in competition with other women. Like other, there, there are sayings. We women are their own enemies. Like there are sayings that insist that we stay together because it benefits, um, you know, the patriarchy for us to not have real, you know, authentic relationship with ourselves. But with this is we are breaking down these walls, and I, I just really see that, you know, the way communities are flourishing online, and I think that they are really making a difference for the way we live our lives offline, and even through COVID. You know, COVID is the best is the best example. Through COVID, I our community went from one to four thousand members daily to fielding ten to fourteen thousand member requests daily. Like wow. our members were there 
all the time. We became, we replaced the hogs that social distancing no longer allows us to have. We replaced the escape that, you know, probably not have electricity in some parts of the world would, you know, not afford some, you know, so many different people. So this is what is possible. And then, and I think I need to make this point and last but not the least on this issue is that just take a moment and think about how being able to meet in communities around subjects big and small essentially helps us to sideline the structures that already exist, which don't always serve our best interest. Mm -hmm. Like that mm -hmm. is just I, I think that's such a good point, especially as we're seeing the breakdown of so many institutions, aspects of society, and, and sort of a, a, a you know, implosion of trust in many ways. Where are you going to find trust, support, resources that you need? And how do you build those in local communities too? I think it's a really, really good point. Bailey, I want to just pick up on something you said, because I think it's super relevant to brands, um, the stuff about testing the waters. And I think there's there's people who join uh, this series who are working on building brands, whether it's, you know, selling at multinational corporations or tiny little startups starting their own thing. What is it that they can take from this, this story? Because, you know, oftentimes a brand does not have that authentic, true purpose driven message, or is that a problem? They've got to get one in, in order to build an authentic community. Or how do you think about that with the brands you advise? Yeah. I mean, if you stand for no, for everyone, you stand for no one. Um, absolutely. And I think yeah. that's one of the absolute, the biggest reasons why a lot of brands fail, even like smaller companies, they, mm -hmm. they, put the cart so far ahead of the horse that they don't do anything for mm -hmm. anyone. And mm -hmm. uh, I think what Lola proves, and also from my experience working at Instagram and studying everything in between, a small number of passionate people can really grow something much, much, much bigger. And that is the hypothesis of community building, is that the people who care are more powerful than the people who don't. And mm -hmm you know, a traditional community building framework that people still reference, although I'm not sure how, um, how, it, how it, if those numbers remain the same, is that 1% of creators create the content that 90% of people consume. And there's mm -hmm. like 9% of engagement in between. People have different statistics of 20% of people make content for 80% of people. And I'm not so interested in framing it that way, but there are small activators that move mm -hmm. much bigger swaths of people. And if it, that is sort of the thing that I, I have to change the mindset when we talk to companies about um, is if they don't care about anything, it's going to be an issue. And also mm -hmm. you actually do have to start small with building personal relationships right. with the people who raise their hand and care the most. And mm -hmm. you know, Lola is actually an example of that for Facebook as a company. We were talking about this before the call started. Um, but I recently interviewed a woman named Lindsay Russell for our podcast, who was one of the first non-technical people around 2016 who decided to focus on Facebook groups. And at the time, there weren't that much, there wasn't that much resource, nor was there much visibility about groups within Facebook. And some woman, a Nigerian woman, a woman of Nigerian descent, told Lindsay and her team, you have to check out Finn. And they got on the phone with Lola and learned so much from Lola, including a follow-up PDF, follow-up PowerPoint slides that Lola sent them, that Lola ended up speaking to the entire product team, eventually came in, met Mark Zuckerberg, did an all staff meeting for everyone at Facebook. And that organization is now probably putting hundreds of millions of dollars worth of investment. They have hundreds of employees and they're building tools for people like Lola. That product was just lying there with you know, very minimal features for people like Lola, who were the ones that were realizing the value, who are making groups like Finn for people who people will say changed their lives. And Facebook didn't do the work before to actually get to know people like Lola and solve problems for them. And she helped to transform that. Now, Facebook's a big company. They have lots of different products. But the reality is Facebook groups don't work unless you have people of the sincere passion level and quality of leadership that Lola has. And there are other people out there doing that. But your software just sits dormant if people don't take it and use it and realize it. Same with many physical products, same with different services. And so I just say, if you don't have a purpose, the place to start is to go 
pick up your phone, find someone in the data or in your social media who is always passionate, who's always raising their hand and get them on the phone and figure out, hey, Lola, why does this matter to you? What does this mean to you? You seem to have passion. You seem to have purpose. We here at headquarters have zero of that. So I'm going to go listen and learn. And those outliers, those people who care a lot, can give you a lot of insight about the there there if you just kind of see it in business language or strategic language. Go to the heart of the issue and learn from those people out there who get it. You know, it's, talking about going to the heart of the issue, I think the conversation, uh, you know, as uh, I don't know, probably unintentionally panned to inclusion, um, which excites me. You see, unfortunately, what I realized is we, even, even as we become better with diver uh, diversity, even as we start to see the visual representations of who is involved in a project, we can see that they are becoming more diverse, which is an amazing thing. But what about inclusion? Are we actually getting to know the people who are around us? Are we really getting to know and understand that the, you know, the differences of the people that we have now assembled? I think that we still have a big giant inclusion gap. Um, and it's unfortunately, it's not as easy because it takes, well, maybe it's easy, depending on what perspective you're looking at it. It takes us actually asking and getting to know people on a real level, listening to mm -hmm. them and placing, taking the time and taking the risk, you know, to place them in positions where their voices makes a difference. So for instance, like look at what Facebook did, just as described by you, coming outside of the regular and reaching out to this, you know, regular woman who started a Facebook group uh, that, you know, for free essentially. And they, they reached out to me to, to understand what I would like to see using the tool. And I, I mean, Facebook would not have contacted me because I'm just like, they could have just said, oh, we'll just go with, we have hundreds of staff, we could just go to them. But they didn't do that. They reached out to me and then they listened to what I had to say. Majority of the ideas that I gave, gave at that time are now in use on Facebook. I've been created and we are using them every day. It is now saves us a, a lot of time and now saves us a lot of you know um, stress and effort. But the truth mm -hmm. of the matter is I feel valued as a community leader because I feel like my experience matters and my experience has you know is able to change and shape such a gigantic corporation that did not need to listen to me but probably needed to listen to me. So that is what I'm saying, is that the conversation about inclusion is so, so central to this conversation. And you know, it's really important here right now. And uh, what I'm working on right now, actually with Lindsay, with Lindsay, I'm working with her on an extraordinary, really incredible uh, project that actually uh, has me leading on inclusion as well. So that's, the, you know, that's what we're doing. Yeah, and that's I, incredible. I, I would just also, I'm j whatever, jumping in here. Um, I think this is true of something like Facebook that builds a software tool for people out in the world to realize it's just code until Lola decides that you have a problem that you want to solve with that. And this approach also works for something like we've interviewed this crockpot company, Instant Pot, which people love yes. wow. and the engineers there stay really close to the people who are the folks that are masters of vegan cooking or Indian cooking or you know they have a use for this that's they lead those local communities those clusters of people and they use this product every single day and the engineers listen to them and solve their problems because they know those stakeholders are really important mm -hmm. and that's what Facebook did with you Lola they knew that you're important to Facebook's future people like you are important to Facebook's future and they did that only problems because they made that decision you see that's only yeah. because right. they made that decision they had to place the microphone in my hands mm -hmm. they had they had to allow my voice to take space. Mm. It's prioritizing that. And it's exactly. also getting, getting close to the problems of your customer and consistently maintaining a channel to hear those problems. I, yeah, I do just want to be mindful of time. So I am opening it up for questions. For any questions people have who are listening, please pop those into the chat. 
or feel free to raise your hand and I can call on you. I do want to ask Bailey, you, you talked so well about the kind of um, the problem brands often run into of not being focused enough, not knowing sort of who you're for, trying to be all things to all people. Would you say there's other kind of common stumbling blocks that brands often run into when they're trying to do this kind of thing, community building? I, you had mentioned working with Nike as kind of an interesting example. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest, early in the conversation, we were, both Lola and I were talking about how community building is about building with and not for. And uh, a lot of companies struggle to give up control. A lot of companies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they want to be the ones standing on stage giving the keynote. They want to make the perfectly crafted advertisement. And the reality is, is Lola is more of an authentic advocate to her community of people about Facebook and what Facebook is than Facebook ever will be, even if they wanted to. If they wanted to make the best commercial in the world. It would not mean as much or say as much as Lola explaining the value of this community does to people in the world. And that piece of, um, we've worked with Nike and I can't talk too much about it in public, but basically they, they invest a lot of money in making events that are completely controlled really expensive and they put everything on and they hire agencies to put everything on. And wouldn't it be much more powerful if they just empowered local people and supported the events that folks are doing out mm -hmm. in the world, instead of just kind of bringing a perfectly curated, expensive, non-replicable event into town once every five years. And so giving up control and saying, we are going to fill some role for you to help you do something you want to do and then supercharge you as you do it. That switch is what people really struggle with. And I, I frankly think a lot of companies are going to struggle in the future going forward who just can't make that switch. I think mm -hmm. there, I think there's very few companies in the world that will survive not doing that, like maybe Apple or something, but mm -hmm. it just doesn't make sense going forward to think, especially in a world with the internet and so many conversations that can be hosted and so many ways for people to talk about your product or interact with it. You can't actually control people. Mm -hmm. That was a total farce. Um, and so if yeah. you I, that's amazing. Wow, Bailey. Sorry, did I interrupt? <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Oh, I love hearing you talk. You please go. <laughs> so, what you said is so true. I was having a ding, ding, ding moment. You know, that, what you said is so true is that so many traditional companies and traditional entities are really struggling to understand how to think about the communities that exist now, um, especially the online communities that are so massive. We are as big and bigger than nations. Literally, Finn has more people in it than the whole of San Francisco and the whole of Vegas put together. And so, you know, to just, <laughs> that's like, that's massive. But, you know, there's a, there's a dynamic in there, in those communities that I think that communities are struggling, you know, traditional organizations are struggling with, is that there is a trust system that has been established between the leadership and the members. Mm -hmm. And that, and that is why they need to understand that in order to be able to assess the power of those communities, they have to defer to the leadership of the community. And they have to defer to the voices and the culture within that community. And that is, I think that that is a struggle for several it's scary. different- scary. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think that is a struggle for them um, mm -hmm. because so far, like people reach out to us all the time. Those of us who like lead communities are, are amazing uh, companies and, you know, Traditional organizations reach out to us all the time and say, oh, we just, we want people to be aware of this product or this brand that we have going on. And then I have to just tell them no, because it's like, they don't understand that this is not regular. We are not just going to right. flood our spaces with ads. We're not going to do that. You, we, like in what ways or in what value-based ways do you, are you aligning with what our community stands for? And that shows that you understand and value the culture of our community. Right, I think that's I, such an important point. I mean, it's so key. You can't just insert brand here when you're talking yeah. about working with these communities, but by the same token as a brand, if you're trying to create that, it goes to the heart of your values. And so I think that's to Bailey's point about why a lot of brands are struggling, but it's not, it's not gonna be a, you know, a maybe, a nice to have as we go forward. It's going to be a must, you know, building a community alongside a business from the start is way more important 
than ever before 100%. because of everything else that's going on in the communities that you've created. Now, I just want to be mindful. It is top of the hour. I'm happy to stay and keep chatting. Um, if people have to go, no problem. But I do just want to alert everyone. I put the details for how to get a copy of Bailey's book, Get Together, this book, uh, which is so phenomenal. Um, oh, was Stripe it? Press, yes, oh, it. Stripe Press <laughs> has generously agreed to give away copies to everybody who is listening live. So the details of how to get that are here. Um, and if you have any other questions, please pop them in the chat. I'm happy to keep chatting for another few minutes. We do have one comment that says, hello, everyone. Finn is a safe haven. Finn has saved my life. <laughs> I mean, talk about testament. I mean, I'm sure you get that all the time, but it must still be pretty moving. Every single time, every yeah. single time, it's, it's everything. Like who tell you start something like you're just trying some, something out, and someone tells you that it's making a difference for them. It's just yeah, it never gets old. Never gets old. Yeah, um, I, I do too, also. Yeah, go ahead. Well, just to say, like more people should start businesses with a purpose, the way that Lola started Finn, with something you actually care about, with a change that you want to make in the world, with a value you want to bring to people's lives. If all you're doing is making something for profit then you don't have a purpose and you're probably not going to be able to rally a community. And I think there's some, there's some issue here in how we think about what businesses are for. You need a business engine. You need to make like money in order to support the goals that you have. But if you are starting something just for profit, then also you should not be trying to build your business with a community in mind, like as a community led business, it's just not going to work. There needs to be something bigger than that. And I think if you don't have that, I, I personally would encourage you to check yourself. The world doesn't need so much more of that. Right. <laughs> if you'll let me sit in here, that is why I actually yeah. love that, you know, what I'm working on now. I have the benefit of working with people who love community on Rising Team. Uh, Rising Team is a business that is, you know, is just still invites only. So <laughs> risingteam.com is still invites only, but that's what they're doing is training, helping to coach managers and leaders so that they can become, you know, be able to meet their potential. So, is, you know, for for instance, if managers are better able to understand and build better relationships with the people who work for and under them, it makes them much more effective. And so, and that is one of my experiences leading our community on Finn. So I have decided to take it to a broader audience uh, on Rise and Same. And it's great. I work with Lindsay as, as well. So it's just really an exciting opportunity for me to see what else is out there and who else we can, you know, help get comfortable with relationship building the right way in a community setting. Well, we're really excited to see, I'm really excited to see all of that unfold and just to see you kind of play in different spaces. If, if the energy and the kind of excitement that you've brought to this group is any indication, I mean, like, what are you going to do next? I'm excited beyond measure to see that. Is there anything that I haven't asked that you both want to uh, talk about, add to, um, just sort of anything that might apply to people who are on this call who want to build their own communities or are working on behalf of brands. Yeah, I, I just have an appreciation for, you know, the people who work on our community thing. You know, it is not just me. And I know that, you know, very easily when you're in the, you're the face of something, people don't realize that it is a collective. It is the power of the collective that makes it whole. And that is so true. It's no truer than in a community where you're not paying people to work with you. They have, you know, we have a large, a volunteer team, a very small, actually, volunteer team of people, women who get up, who like me, get up every single day to be a part of this. And it's, you know, I did not ever think that was possible. I did not ever think that could happen, but they are showing up every day and night. So I think that, you know, for everyone who's watching this and you want to start a community, I want you to recognize that there's a lot of people who want to help. And they are there for you as long as you validate them and you understand they are not doing it for you. They're doing it for the larger cause that you stand for. And another thing, I don't think it's possible to manufacture filling in the gap. It has to be your experience in order for you to be able to ignite the kind of passions that you need uh, on, on, in a community, the kind, this kind of community. You can't make this stuff up. Like that is the reason why I started explaining, you know, the reason why I started this right from, you know, my at 11 years old, you know, that this is about Person, a personal awakening. It starts with the personal awakening for every single person who has built any kind of community that is mm -hmm. worth anything. Your, your personal awakening creates it. Then your instinctive you know, understanding of that experience is what 
helps to maintain and to grow it. So that, that is what I think that everyone should know if you wanted to start a community. Well, yeah, with that, I mean, yeah. talk about it. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I will keep it short, I promise. But um, the only thing I'll say is communities feel magical, but they don't start by magic. Lola, you know, you were probably a sliver away from maybe not even opening a Facebook group and you decided to do it and take that step to get started. And I wonder how many people are out there that are a sliver away from either starting or joining and moving forward a community that could be a safe haven for them, could really save their life, change their life, change other lives. And that's what I really care about is just helping more people cross that line into participating or starting something that they care about or changing the way your business works with the people you serve. But it just doesn't happen by magic. Someone like Lola started it and got it going. That doesn't mean it's the best part of the work. There's a lot that comes after that, but a lot of people get blocked just from getting started. And mm -hmm. that's the part that I want to remind people that they can do that. There's a science. The science is in here. <laughs> and We're, here I'm also, We're here to help. I'm also going to take, uh, take this episode and kind of crunch and distill it into really a few key actionable takeaways that you can use to apply to your business, whatever it might be. Um, because I think there's just been so much great stuff in here and it's super juicy and I'm excited to dig it. So I'll be sharing that after. So if you're signed up to get the emails, you will uh, get that recap. So a huge, huge thank you to Bailey and to Lola and to everybody who joined today and whoever asked that amazing question and, and all the comments about how meaningful the group has been uh, to them. Talk about a testament to your work. So I'm, I'm excited to keep watching what you both do because it's so incredible. And I, I'm so grateful you could join today. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for hosting us. Lola, it was awesome. a total treat. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> See everybody later. Bye. Bye. Bye, Internet. I think there's. <laughs> See everyone. <laughs>